My name is Chris Harwood. I am uh, president of the New York chapter of SVU, the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this afternoon's program, this evening's program, if you're joining us from Europe. Uh, it's our first event since our epic reading of the Good Soldier Schweik back uh, in late April. Please check us out on social media, follow us there. Uh, we would love to hear back from you uh, uh, with your feedback on this program or on previous programming. You can contact us at, and we would invite you to uh, tune in for um, this program, uh, the Rehearsal for Truth program being run by our sister organization uh, at BBLA, the Václav Havel Library Fund, uh, Foundation. Uh, and it will be our own Vít uh, uh, uh puppeteer extraordinaire who will be uh, uh, performing audience uh, by Václav Havel. That's coming up as part of the festival uh, later in June. So, and we encourage you to subscribe. We did manage to break the 100 subscriber mark, so you can find us by, by looking for Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences. And so uh, now, uh, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker for our Sunday in the Park program. And that is Deniak Novak, who is the world's leading expert on the Liechtenstein, Lednice, and Baltice cultural landscape and historical gardens and cultural landscapes. Uh, he currently serves as director of the National Agriculture Museum in Prague. Uh, and he was pr previously director of the Monument Preservation Institute in South Moravia. Uh, and was also a former deputy minister and general director at the Czech Ministry of Culture. Uh, he's active in the Czech Heritage Fund and is the author of the successful nomination of Lednice Valtice for the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, he facilitated eight other successful nominations for UNESCO, including the Kromieži Chateau and Gardens and uh, the famous Tugendhat Villa in Brno. In 2017, he co-authored an extensive catalog for the exhibition, The Garden of Europe at Lednice Chateau, presenting the history of the Lednice Valtice cultural landscape exhibition. Uh, that was in Czech. Uh, and the exhibition and catalog were part of a, a project called Cultural Landscapes as a Space for Social Representation and Ra Relaxation. Uh, of selected aristocratic families from the 17th century to the beginning of the 20th century. And this program was made possible with support of the Czech Ministry of Culture. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Zdeněk Novak. Take it, Zdeněk. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Good afternoon from Prague. I am happy to have a possibility to explain something about quite unique artificial landscape in the world, uh, which is, uh, which will be in December this year, 25 years uh, inscribed to the World Heritage List. And uh, I try to do my best to tell you a story about this beautiful landscape. I hope all you know that where is New York, where is Czech Republic here in Europe, uh, in heart of Europe is our beautiful country, and in this country, in the corner between Slovakia and Austria, there is that place of uh, stories of Liechtenstein landscape. This is a map of the Czech Republic showing the richness of cultural heritage, and this is this landscape. You can see how large it is in that map. And for comparison, you can compare the area of Principality of Liechtenstein here in Europe between Austria and Switzerland and Lednice Valtice cultural landscape. The area of Principality Liechtenstein is 160 square kilometers. And uh, this uh, so-called protected area of Lednice Valtice cultural landscape they are 143 square kilometers, but uh, in real, it's uh, about 500 square kilometers. So you can compare how rich they were, the Liechtenstein family, how rich uh, he, they was to be able to create such beautiful landscape. Coat of arms 
it's uh, till today has some part of uh, area of Czech, Czech Republic of today. This is Opava and Karnov and Silesia. The dominant, dominant of that landscape is uh, these hills, small hills, Palava hills, but in this very flat area, it's really very important dominant. And it belonged to Liechtenstein family till the half of 16th century. Uh, they had uh, built Mikulov castle, but then they sold this property and uh, they tried to get it back some different ways uh, through weddings through to buy it, but they were not successful. So they had to uh, realize the, their sense of art in very flat landscape, very boring landscape, I must say. And you will see how, how interesting, how fresh the landscape now is. This uh, part of Europe is very old in cultural history. Uh, the very famous uh, statue of uh, Venus of Viestonice was found here in this place. So it's not far from Lednice, Valtice cultural landscape. When Liechtenstein came to this area in 13th century, the landscape was like this, some wet landscape, no order, no organization. And after 700 years, they have really created some jewel among landscape. The Prince Karl Eusebius of Liechtenstein was the head of the family. Uh, since 1645 till 1682. And he was very uh, active in architecture. He started to collect arts, uh, paintings and sculptures. And he wrote a book about architecture with some instructions for the next members of family, how to build the uh, buildings and gardens for Prince. So he's very important personality in the Liechtenstein family. Now we uh, can see him as he was 17, 18 years old. And in this age, he visited Paris in France and he uh, was uh, introduced to the royal court, to Louis XIII and his wife, Queen Anna of Austria, uh, introduced him to gardens of Tuileries next to Louvre today, because Palace of Tuileries is gone more than, more than 100 years. So this is the first phase of that landscape of Lednice, probably drawing of Prince Karl Eusebius of Liechtenstein. It's, it dates from 1640, and we can see here everything what we call now the French garden architecture, of Lenotter style. The trouble is that this, this uh, drawing is more than 20 years older than Lenotter's uh, designs for Tuileries and Versailles. And we can see here the axis of the landscape, the water garden, the Italian garden, and very complicated parterre in front of the, in front of the palace. From that time, this is how the Liechtenstein chateau or villa in that time in Legnice looked. And this is the orangery of the garden connected through this way to Grotta under the palace. It still exists and is the uh, largest grotta, the artificial cave in uh, Czech Republic from 17th century. And this is the only rest of the French garden of Lednice in the Lednice Park today. So we have some signs how it was in, future, in, in the past. And this is the uh, aerial view of that garden, which was admired as the most beautiful garden and landscape in the empire of uh, Habsburg's emperors. Emperor was in Lednice 1671 and was fascinated by the beautiful garden. So Prince Karl Eusebius was very proud. And uh, this is the first view 
tu Valtice, the south part of the Lednice Valtice Cultural Landscape, and uh, already from 17th century, 1670 or so, and we can see here the avenues in the landscape, which is quite unique, this structure of avenues in our country. These avenues, as we will see, they went to Valtice as a center of a dream. The dream of princes was to have here the principality of Liechtenstein here in Moravia, in South Moravia. But this area is too strategic in the Roman Empire, so the emperor never gave agree to create principality Liechtenstein here. So only these avenues and the palace are some marks of uh, a dream of the family of Liechtenstein to have the principality here. This is the first official record of the landscape of Lednice from army, the first military mapping of the Roman uh, Empire by Joseph II, the Emperor Joseph II. And this mapping uh, was done by uh, some military officers and you can see that even military officers, they recognize that there is some special garden and very special structure, so-called star, for hunting, for parfors hunting in the French style. And uh, this is the record of the landscape in the, F of, uh, in the end of uh, 18th century. So there is a chateau, the French garden, uh, this is the infrastructure in the landscape for, uh, for par force hunting. And after 10 years, this landscape was totally changed by Prince Alois I of Liechtenstein, who is in the role of Prince's next very important personality for development of the landscape. He was owner of the largest area of, uh, of uh, wood, of uh, forests. And in the end of 18th century, before the Industrial Revolution, industry used only the energy of the wooden coal to produce everything. And uh, Liechtenstein wood, Liechtenstein forests, they were empty without any wood, in fact. So he sent some group of botanishers to West part of United States. They traveled from Lednice to Hamburg, London, Plymouth, New York, and they spent four years in this area of uh, United States collecting some American trees to improve the quality of wood of, in the property of Liechtensteins. And they sent thousands of small plants and tons of seeds from this part of America to Europe. And Prince uh, Alois I of Liechtenstein built some nurseries for these American trees. And uh, they sell them not only to, to Austria or Hungary, but they exported these American trees to Russia, to St. Petersburg, to France, and to Germany, of course. So this is our first connection to East part of the United States. After 10 years, the Prince Alois I created such structure of the landscape, uh, of, the, of the garden with the center. Uh, there was folly of sun because Liechtenstein means jewel and everything what was connected to light was very important for representation of princes of Liechtenstein. So there was uh, the temple or folly of sun and in these eight axes were eight dominants uh, showing the program of a garden, which we call Garden anglo chinoise And uh, there was a Gothic house. There was some, some imitation of ruin of uh, triumphal arc. Uh, there was uh, some water jets in beautiful Baroque uh, basin. And uh, here there were some uh, sculpture of three graces. And here the most important building 
the mosque with minaret, which was the dominant of the landscape and uh, is quite unique in all the world. This is the mosque, very atypical mosque and minaret. Minaret is 65 meters tall, is really the biggest, the hugest minaret, decorative minaret, decorative building in the world. There were, there were no Muslims here in, in Legnice, it's just decoration in the garden. But in comparison to minarets which were built in Kew Garden, for instance, they were about 15 meters tall. Uh, Schwetzingen, the same. Uh, then Catherine the Great of Russia built a mosque with minaret in Tsarskoye Selo. And the minaret is about eight meters high. So in comparison to this huge building, they are very they are miniatures. You can compare how it is. It's like in Epcot Park, where you, when you go around the lake, you can meet different uh, cultures, Venice, Paris, China, Germany, England. So this is uh, the beginning of the program of such uh, parks as Epcot Park uh, is uh, in Florida. It was built in the year 1790, uh, 1797 till 1802. So it's very old building. Brother of Alois the uh, first, Johann the first of Liechtenstein, who was successful marshal general of the army during the Napoleon Wars. He was able, as rich he was, uh, he was able to create quite new quality in the landscape architecture. And he totally changed the way of thinking in landscaping. And the rest of his activity is this huge landscape, which, he, which we now call Lednice Valtice Culture Landscape, and was established since 1805, when he became to be a head of the Liechtenstein family till 1836 uh, in the year he, in that year he died. So here you can see this avenues to Valtice showing the Valtice is the center of this micro world. There is a serial of uh, fish ponds uh, built by Liechtenstein in uh, the late medieval time and Legnice. There are woods and some parks and so on. And in these small pictures, there is the program of Follies built in different places in this large, beautiful artificial landscape. So the trick was that the collection of so-called staffage Follies in the gardens uh, anglo chinoise which uh, usually in the world, they are built in one garden, one park, in Stourhead in England, in Stow in England, in Schwetzingen in Germany, Drottningholm in Sweden, Tsarskoye Selo uh, or Pavlovsk in Russia. It's, uh, I can say, normal. But here in Lednice Valtice Culture Landscape, the program of uh, the garden anglo chinois was spread from the, the garden of Lednice Chateau to this huge area of landscape from 200 hectares to 500 square kilometers. And uh, what happened in, in Valtice? Valtice Chateau froze in the Baroque splendor. And till today, Valtice Chateau has to show the tradition, the long being here in that part of Europe, the long being of Liechtenstein family here. So where everything, anything was changed in Valtice, even in 20th century, was built or decorated in Baroque style, Baroque piece of art. And what happened in Lednice Garden when it was uh, empty of any forest with one exception, which is Minaret. You can see quite different face of this garden. There are no vistas, no avenues no direct lines, everything is S-shaped. And instead of vista between the chateau and minaret, there are 10 filters, not to be seen minaret or mosque, 
mineral porcine because it's too tall. And here, the beauty of the garden was created only from the combination of uh, trees, shrubs, lawns, water, and mirror underwater, and this trick. The quality of vegetation, vegetation and the very important role played in the time, the trees and shrubs from United States. This garden was in the time something like advertisement for the nurseries. They were situated north from this garden. And in the garden, the people who wanted to buy some American trees, they can watch how beautiful they are, and then they buy, they bought them. So this is quite empty of follies, or there are some small follies that were escaped after some years. And you can see how many coniferous trees are here in this garden. And they are some white pines, some juniperus from Virginia, some spruces, European spruces and European pines. And this is uh, really extraordinary in comparison to contemporary English garden or German landscape garden, uh, gardens uh, where the coniferous were not used or very rarely some cedars, some cedars, some pines, but not in huge groups like in Lednice garden. So the Lednice garden was already in the beginning of 19th century quite different from other so-called English gardens. And this trend was developed through all 19th century, added uh, some new forms of trees and shrubs, especially colorful as we will see them. So the garden today is just a combination of water, islands, and trees, coniferous trees, dominant coniferous trees, and colorful trees. The garden is very colorful in comparison to English or German gardens. And we can do some short walk through the landscape. This is the John's Castle, the imitation of ruin of medieval castle, using some parts from the original Liechtenstein Castle next to Vienna. This is the triumphal arc instead of the artificial ruin or imitation of ruin. Now we have a beautiful triumphal arc and uh, the, the folly of three graces, the border folly, which is quite unique because uh, half of that building was built in Moravia and this half was built in Austria. After World War II, the area of uh, Valkice region was added to Czechoslovakia. So now uh, all the folly is in Czech Republic. And here you can see the map today with, this, uh, with the symbol of the world heritage, Valkice, Legnice, and the follies in the landscape. Uh, you can use bicycles to visit them. This is very flat landscape, very comfortable for bicycles. The structure of the landscape was ready, as I have said, during the life of John I of Liechtenstein. And his son, Alois II, added only this small chapel of St. Hubertus and reshaped the Lednice Chateau. In contrast to Valtice Chateau, the Lednice Chateau was, had new dress in every fashion in architecture in Europe. It started as a Renaissance villa, then it was rebuilt in Manieristic Chateau, Baroque, the new classicism, and finally, the Windsor Neo-Gothic, but because before he built the new face of the chateau, he built this beautiful glass house. This is the oldest glass house of this type in continental Europe from 1842 to 1845. And then he, this is the interior of the glass house. And then in opposite to Minaret, there is the new skyline of the new fairy tale chateau in the fairy tale garden. So this is the last phase of Lednice chateau from the years 1845 till 1858. And you can see how 
It combines some <clears throat> designs from castles, cathedrals, uh, medieval houses, and it's really very beautiful with the new garden. This is the chapel of San Hubertus. And uh, in fact, the last prince who had influence of the landscape of Lednice Valtice was Johann II, John II of Liechtenstein, who governed for 71 years. Imagine that one man can govern the Liechtenstein principality 71 years. He was born in Lednice and he reshaped uh, the garden. He established quite new garden in the up-to-date modern Italic style, uh, some refreshment of Italian garden style. And this is the garden. And he collected plants and trees in four collected cabinet verdier in the French garden. So this garden is some combination of Italian and French garden. And this type of flower designs is quite very typical for Lenice landscape. As I told you about the development of quite different type of landscaping in Legnice, this is a very unique art, very rare one to change the feeling of space with uh, tricks of landscape architecture. You can remember that Legnice Chateau is built in a very flat landscape and now you have a feeling that it's a castle on a high hill and uh, the next step, which is uh, typical for Lednice Garden, is the combination of very colorful trees, which was criticized by German landscape architects in 18th century. And these uh, colors combining, especially the red trees, red beaches, red uh, acers, are from the period about 25 years before Fauvism in Paris saw so the world. And the last addition to this rich development of the garden architecture in the world is the Trich Melas garden in, in Altice. I would like to thank the World Monuments Fund, UNESCO World Heritage Center, Czech Ministry of Culture, Prince Hans Adam II of Liechtenstein and his Prince Collection for their persistent cooperation and deep support. Thank you very much. And if you have some questions, you can send it to me, to this address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. This is a great introduction to this feature. And I think it, for those of us who are new, is uh, certainly whetted our curiosity. And some of that will get satisfied by our next speaker, who is Stefan Jarabek, who is a landscape architect uh, based in Saugerties, New York. And he is the president of Friends of Czech Greenways. Uh, of Czech and Slovak descent, Stefan helped design and develop the Prague Vienna Greenways project in Czechoslovakia uh, from the time of its conception in 1990. Uh, he contributed to the creation of the St. John Nepomucene Trail uh, in Telč, which is also a UNESCO site, uh, and worked on uh, the initial restoration plan for the town square in Baltica. His collaborative work uh, with Zdeněk Novák uh, and landscape documentation at the 1993 and 94 uh, Charette on conservation and economic enhancement of Lednice Valtice, uh, sponsored by the World Monuments Fund, uh, contributed to the UNESCO designation as a World Heritage uh, Cultural Landscape. Stefan is an active member of several major Hudson River Valley heritage and preservation in initiatives uh, such as the Hudson River Valley Greenway and the Hudson River National Heritage Area. Uh, in addition, he designed landscape restoration of an early 17th century Bohemian settlement in the Hudson River Valley. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to uh, turn the screen over to Stefan. Dobry večer, dami a panove. Those are words that were music to my ears when I started working on the Greenway project in Czechoslovakia. I would like to present a quote by uh, President Dubček. In the service of the people, we followed such a policy that socialism would not lose its human face. 
we shall have to remove everything that strangles artistic and scientific endeavors. This quote was at the time when I was in elementary school and learned the fact that the American troops liberated Pilsen and stayed in Pilsen for six days while they waited per the agreement at Yalta for the Soviets to liberate Prague. During that time, my grandfather's brother and his three sons were executed by the Germans uh, during the uh, pre-liberation days in Prague. This set me on a mission personally to do anything I could for Czechoslovakia, for its freedom. I was involved with the Charter 77 movement in New York City. I did everything I could to help liberate this one man called Václav Havel, who was imprisoned. We would raise money. We would be active. Um, in Alex Haley, I have to thank for 1979, I traveled to Czech, the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic and learned and connected with my cultural heritage. The handsome man that you just spoke, heard from, I had the privilege of meeting in the early days. Zdenek is from Hileva, uh, 13th century town found, founded by good King Wenceslas, located on the border of Bohemia and Moravia. His Taida culture is evident and he was born with it. Myself, as I mentioned, as, as was mentioned, I'm of Czechoslovak heritage in the United States. And uh, our dear friend, Lubomir Kamelash, his family was from Zlin. Lou's father was an engineer with Batya Shoes and he traveled vastly. Lubomir was born in Baghdad, raised in Nairobi, sent off to England during World War II for safety and for an education. He then moved to Canada, where he met the most lovely and gorgeous Therese Lockwood, who, upon accepting his proposal of marriage, did so under one condition, that he remove her from Toronto as soon as possible and take her to New York. Lou succeeded in doing that. I would like to quote our great president, Václav Havel. He said that hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. This is the passion that Lou, in his retirement as a prominent engineer in New York City, brought to the concept of how do I give back to my country? Lou being somewhat of a gypsy, Czechoslovak, he wanted to do something. He was familiar with the Hudson River Valley Greenway, and he thought, ah, oh, there's a new country. Czechoslovakia is liberated. Let's convert the Iron Curtain to a Greenway. It's perfect. He elicited the help of people like Bonnie Burnham and uh, Wendy Lures from the Foundation for Civil Society, um, the Crest Foundation, numerous foundations he went to in his uh, prominent role in New York City. And he was quite an ambassador and an advocate and he roped everybody into supporting him to go with David Sampson from the Hudson River Valley Greenway and uh, the Rockefeller Brother Fund, Bill Moody. And they went to Prague to present the idea of greenways and that this would be a way to create a uh, good out of the Iron Curtain. At the time, the Czechoslovak people or those representatives in Prague did not think this was a good idea. They rather and pointedly said, we don't want to memorialize this wall. They, they talked about it. Lou contacted his cousin, David Spich, uh, Daniel Spichka and Radek Neprash, and they kicked the ball around. They said, well, maybe we should have a greenway, you know, somehow link. And Lou said, you got to link it to Vienna because there's a uh, very positive attitude by Americans and Westerners toward Vienna. And Praha was a little dubious. It had been a communist country. So that was the birth of it. But as they talked about this concept, they, they couldn't figure out how to pull it together. And when they were in Prague, they talked about the Greenway. And some of the architects said, Hudson Valley Greenway, you must know Stepan Jerzebek. They said, well, we don't know any Stepan Jerzebek because my name is Steve Jarabek in America. Uh, he was here lecturing a year ago about the Greenway and environmental protection. 
when they came back to the United States, we were put together. We met at Candlewick, their home in Palinville along mm -hmm. the Hudson. And I was invited for tea. After several scotches, the Camelash version of tea, we conceived in the idea of a partnership to move forward. The whole concept of Greenway was relatively new in Europe completely, in fact. And I love this photo. We were traveling in the early days before we formally dedicated the Greenway. And these babichkas stopped us and said, what are you doing? We said, well, we're bicycling. We're going to create this greenway for people to hike and bicycle from place to place. Well, that's totally useless. You're not being productive. You should be collecting firewood. You should be collecting mushrooms. What kind of thing is this that you can do that you just bicycle around? You know, there was a great cultural um, awareness that was developed, and we were embraced by the great people of Czechoslovakia along the way. The uh, photo on your right, we can, my favorite first Republican, uh, we call him Papa Krejci. He's the father of the mayor of uh, Sedlitzburchica. He hiked with us in the early days. This is my favorite young person, Teresa Lvova from Valtica, who helped us negotiate all the trails and figure out how we would get go forward. But one of my regrets during our adventure was that I had wanted to create a oral history program for the first Republicans of which Papa Krejci was. What was our history that was so diminished over 50 years? On the dedication route in 1996, here's Radek Nepraj, here's Vera Filkova, an accomplished landscape architect from Brno, Lou, of course, and then the mayors, we went from every town that signed our compact on the trail over 16 days in May of 96, uh, going from uh, St. Stephen's to St. Vitus in Praha to dedicate the, the trail. And to create the trail was an interesting thing. I, I did skip over the quote by our great president, Tomasz Masaryk. Masaryk felt that the trail system in Czechoslovakia was a national birthright. And it was extremely important to the culture and the history of the people. In Czechoslovakia, from village to village, you'd have not just one trail, but several trails. And most of the trails were purposeful. We were a trail to go get wood, a trail to get mushrooms, uh, a trail to go fishing. And uh, we had the task of going along the route from Prague to Vienna to select the best trail for cultural and ecological attraction and, to, uh, and for recreation. So we had permission from the government to put our stickers on the wayfinding along these trails to direct people along the way. The other thing that we did was in uh, Valtica, my good friend Zdenek, I approached him one day and I said, you know, we'd like to clear all those woods by the Reisna. The Reisna was the border pavilion, uh, which had been in the purview or the domain of the Iron Curtain. It was a monument that was left, uh, a monument that had bullet holes in it from target practice by the military. And we wanted to restore it. And so the proposal was to have these Putney students from the United States who did many projects in the Valtica Lenisa Gardens for restoration to clear the vista to the Reisna. Then I said, I don't think the environmental people are going to let you do that. So we went off to Zhezlav, we talked to them, and they said, oh, please remove those trees. There are rare alpine flowers in that area that will thrive if you remove the trees. So here we have students from the United States accomplishing that task. The Prague Vienna Greenway was novel, as I say, it was a trendsetter, not only in Czechoslovakia, but in Europe. And since its evolution, many loop trails have been developed off this trail. And they, my favorite is the wine trail near Znoimo because we had to do it in a curving manner so that when you go from wine cellar to wine cellar, you can drive straight. Um, so it was just a great noble exercise. This greenway, 
has been modeled, has become the model for most of Europe. And the whole movement has, has prospered. We were proud in 1993 to have the Hudson River Valley Greenway become a sister greenway of the Czech Greenway. And the most noble thing was Wendy Lures from the, Lures, excuse me, from the Foundation for Civil Society uh, negotiated that President Havel would also sign the charter. My greatest regret was that Mario Cuomo and Havel didn't sit in the same room because that would have been a great event. <laughs> two great minds and two great humanitarians would have really gotten along with each other. Uh, you know, the Hudson Valley Greenway became an important partner. And in uh, before 90, around 93, we had a group of 12 people come from the Hudson Valley, including Meg Downey of the Poughkeepsie Journal and uh, Barney McHenry, uh, who is a, a prominent citizen in the United States, uh, chair of the Hudson Valley Greenway. And it was a cultural exchange. And what the Americans found was that, my God, you've accomplished in six years what we've been trying to do in 15. You know, the, the, the Czech Greenway succeeded because it was new and fresh and it wasn't hampered by old traditions. So here again, we see the many Greenways that have become children of the um, Czech Greenway, the, the Prague Vienna Greenway. And, uh, you know, you just can't say enough about the partnership that we had with the people of uh, Czechoslovakia. And this comes to the uh, garden itself. Thierry Kameler, Kamelash was a willing partner who was hijacked by her Hudson, her husband, to come to the Czech Republic to follow his dream. She embraced it wholly. Virginia James became an active partner through the Hickory Foundation to support the work that the Greenway was doing. And what we looked at was the Valtica Chateau. Now the Valtica Chateau, as it, Desdenek stated, was sort of the sister or the Cinderella of the two sisters. Now, this is an earlier shot. I love seeing Desdenek's current shot of the garden. It's changed over time as it's be, come into restoration. The uh, key thing that I want to share is that these monuments were preserved over those 50 years by dedicated architects and landscape architects such as Denek. And, you know, Prague is not the city that it is, weren't it for their ingenuity in overcoming obstacles to preserve their cultural heritage. And enough cannot be said about that. The Palava Hills is where, is the heart, if you will, the ecological, biological heart of the Valtica Lednica area. Uh, it's known as the Moravian Tuscany, but more importantly, it is identical to the Shangum Mountains of the Hudson River Valley. Similar geology, similar terrain, um, it, enough can't be said. Now this area had been planted with vines by the Romans for ancient times. And the Shangum Valley uh, on the mountains, they are, have been growing wine for a couple hundred years. I facilitated some vintners from Czechoslovakia from the Valtisa area to come to the Hudson Valley to take rootstock. And in fact, many of the vineyards now in the area have Hudson River Valley or Shangum Mountain rootstock to grow their grapes. The Iron Curtain Trail, well, Lou, as always, was way ahead of his time. It is now a reality. And it was a very painful chapter in the history of the world, really, not just Czechoslovakia or those countries affected. I'll share with you that when we started the Greenway, the Fienvertel, the those communities, because we linked to Valtica were part of our Greenway, they jumped on the bandwagon and started putting up the Greenway signs faster than anyone else. And we asked them, why, why are you so eager? And their response was, we've been frozen too. No investment was made here north of Vienna, because there was always the worry that we would succumb to the Soviets. And the finest Austrian wine, by the way, is in the Fienvertel, but it's still yet to be discovered. 
the through the World Monuments Fund and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, we brought people from the United States to meet with our com compatriots in Czechoslovakia to brainstorm how do you really sustain these vast huge structures bill cecil of vanderbilt from biltmore came and waxed poetically about how, what they did to keep their property going i mean it's not as though the americans had a great answer to how to sustain great mansions economically we all struggle with this concept but it was a great partnership of people including Hans Dorn from Germany, a landscape architect, people from Europe, uh, excuse me, from England, who all came together to kick the ball around. What could be done to save this great world heritage site? The Herb Garden Project was Therese genius, an avid gardener. We can see in this early photo, this is where the herb garden was starting to develop. This was a cutting garden area of the great estate. This is the before pictures. It was used for propagation, uh, you know, a really important site just alongside the chateau. And here you have the 1868 uh, most developed plan of the, of the estate. This is where we were looking to develop our garden. The kitchen gardens were here. Uh, the great park proceeds here. Right over here was a simple museum, a very wonderful museum, was rarely open to the public. And one day Therese stumbled in and found all these, this treasure trove of information about the Bauer brothers and the herbal history of the, of the area. And she said, oh, wouldn't it be great to do an herb garden someday? And that was the genesis of the concept of doing a garden. We lost Therese in a tragic, car accident. And we move forward and we got students. <laughs> My family's laughing because this Slovak always keeps la crying. Uh, working with Shemek, excuse me, um, Kretrzyk, he <laughs> got together his students. And this was also thankful to um, uh, to Virginia James and her effort through the Hickory Foundation to support young people in the explore, exploration of landscape architecture. These students came together with all kinds of fabulous ideas of how to develop a herb garden that was contemporary, but also respected the history and culture of that place. And here was the winning design as a model. And um, you have really spectacular people. As I said, uh, Adam Barash with his back is an alumnus of the Hickory Summer Program. He is now the director of the Silva Taroka Research Institute for Landscape and Ornamental Gardening in Pruhonica. Uh, the design is unique because it sets up thematic gardens. The hands-on learning, the students themselves were re recruited, if not put into servitude, to install the uh, plantings. Um, it was just an amazing project. And they're all from the Mendel University. For those of you who don't know and aren't aware of how glorious this area is, Gregor Mendel did his experiments in Lenica. The cultural heritage of this area cannot be underestimated. On the opening day, we see Lubomir. Uh, he has an umbrella because dire rains were predicted, just like today here in the East Coast and, and in Valtica itself. And uh, we think Tari was less smiling on us that she kept it sunny. Uh, you have Virginia James and Bonnie Burnham and the American ambassador to Czechoslovakia, Janone Walker, at the dedication of the garden. And Janone is a current board member of the Friends of Czech Greenways. The gardens have, as I said, themes, the A through CH are the various themed gardens. You have below them the, the uh, cherry orchard. Uh, this was designed by the, the student designer, wanted it to be a place of reflection and repose. Uh, the glass house, glass house gift shop is here. The new entrance right from the town square is here. And uh, you have the walls with faucets, 
It's an extraordinary garden. It has over 300 species of herbs to, that are flourishing. Okay, Zdenek, I know this is not a good season this year, but it's going to come in, I promise you. The uh, ancient, er the themed garden beds have the ancient herbs, aromatic herbs, culinary herbs, dye herbs, herbs for butterflies and bees, lovers herbs, my favorite, medicinal herbs, mythology herbs, and traditional Chinese medicine. And the key is that these plants are thriving there and people can come and see them in their reality as Zdenek talked about people coming to Lenitsa hundreds of years ago to see American plants, to see if, how they flourish and whether they should be brought into their homes. That tradition continues in the Tari Kamelesh Garden. The parterre with its great axial view to the Baroque arch, um, the, the lush landscape. It's a very popular garden. Even during this past pandemic, uh, the funds that uh, they normally raise through ticket sales and things were actually higher than they were in previous years with less visitors um, because people needed to be in the garden to be rejuvenated. The, the arch that's here on the right was donated by a local nursery. They were supplying the plants to the garden and it's kind of a fun story. Uh, it was put on a delivery truck along with the many plants that the garden needed by mistake. And they got to the garden and the de truck delivery guy said, uh, they say this isn't for them. And the owner of the nursery said, ask them if they want it, I'll donate it. So it's a lovely addition to the gardens. The cherry orchard, as I mentioned, is an amazing place. I mean, here we are 10 years later, they're in full leaf, full glory. They become a really quiet place for people to gather. The uh, whole key was to make the garden a destination as a park, you know, to come away and, and enjoy yourself during those hot Moravian summers. The water walls in, got children involved uh, to, you know, water the plants, water each other and just be connected with the process of the garden. And the garden's designed for not only bees, but birds. Uh, interesting sidebar, what we learned during this whole Iron Curtain issue, uh, near Zetslav is some 40 acres, or maybe 40 hectares, excuse me, of land that was a no man's land fenced off. And I'm told that there are unique birds that aren't found anywhere else in Europe because of the different types of pesticides were used in the area and the area was closed off to public visitation. So you have a bounty of uh, wildlife to, through default <laughs> and uh, the, doing everything and to show people how you can attract bees, bumblebees and insects, beneficial insects to your garden. And we've been working deliberately with the garden shop to help them with marketing um, to, in order to sustain the operation and the maintenance of the gardens. The Friends of Czech Greenways uh, supports these, this entire garden with funds to do rehabilitation, renovation, new features as best we can. But we're always striving to put the garden on a solid footing so that it can prosper into the future. Uh, biggest honor we had in 2017 was the European Award for Ecological Gardening. They touted this as one of the finest gardens in Central Europe, ecological gardens. And the uh, Hickory Foundation, uh, these workshops, we're just thrilled to, and this was a passion of Virginia James that we support young people in the profession of landscape architecture. Now we come to some noble forebears of the area. Uh, Abbot Norbert Bosius was a uh, abbot for the Order of the Merciful Brothers that had been in Valtica since 1605. He was there in the 18th century. And he was there to, uh, he studied medicine and surgery in Vienna. In 1763, he came to Valtica and provided medical care and education. He collected local herbs, used them in his practice. He established a medicinal herb garden and vineyard and a monastery. He collected plants. His, his herbarium can be seen in Brno at the Brothers Monastery. He had hired a painter 
who was a very accomplished painter who suddenly passed away and Norbert took care of the man's three sons, Joseph Ferdinand and Franz Bauer. He sent them to Vienna to study art. As young boys, they drew flower pots in his, in his herbarium. And ultimately they created a codex, a collection of all the herbal plants of the area called the Codex Lichtenstein. Franz Bauer, who was uh, preeminent in botanical artistry, he was, became the resident artist at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. And he was a pioneer in using a microscope for botanical studies. He's also buried at Kew. The Ferdinand Bauer became a natural history artist on botanical expeditions. Joseph Banks hired him to go to, on an expedition to Australia and also to Greece to document the, the plants there. Uh, it was said that uh, Goethe said that they were the Michelangelo's of botanic art. And uh, so very prominent local Val people from Valtica that are actually a little appreciated. It wasn't until the um, Codex Lichtenstein was, was um, created um, and the, the uh, Walter Lack, who is a prominent author, has written uh, his latest treatise was the Bauer Brothers, Three Lives for Science and Arts for the Natural History Museum in London to promote their work. What is most fascinating, however, is when they went into the field to document plants and wildflowers, they could not carry the palette of paints necessary to accurately convey what each herb or flower or plant was. So they created a numbering system to their key so that when they got to their studio, they could accurately paint those plants. Shemek Kreshershik inspirationally developed a program to teach the local students the same methodology. So they come from the local schools, they come to the garden, they use the same system of color by numbers, and then they create their works of art. There's also adults who join in that adventure. I'm gonna share a greeting from the garden. We are looking forward to your visit in the Lou and Tirich Malar Hep Garden. Those are our managers. President Havel once, once said that the real test of a man is not when he plays the role that he wants for himself, but when he plays the role that destiny has for him. Lou and Tari were such people. They embraced life. They embraced their community. A favorite sidebar is in Mikulov where they bought homes and restored them to further the preservation of Mikulov, the nearby town. They saw that there was tension between the community and the gypsies. They organize street fairs, where to this day, the gypsies are with the community celebrating life. Our utmost gratitude goes to them, but most importantly to the Kamelash family, the children who were abandoned here in the United States <laughs> as they followed their passion. They were very supportive, all their children and grandchildren, but you know, it was a great sacrifice to spend all that time in the place, another place that they loved. And I especially want to thank Susanna Halsey for all her diligent work on behalf of the Greenway. And I thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Stefan, for the presentation, which brings us up to date on some of the things that have happened in the area of Valtica Lednica since the fall of communism. Uh, so I definitely want to open the floor up uh, to questions for either of our speakers now. I think we've got a couple of them that came in on the Q&A that I will um, uh, interpret in just a moment, but I'm going to take advantage of my privilege here 
as moderator to, to ask a question of Zdenek. Um, uh, thank you again, Zdenek, for your presentation, which kind of gave us the big historical overview of this area. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, you know, your, your narrative started to taper off uh, with the reference to the, the last uh, Prince of Liechtenstein and, um, and Stefan's presentation gave us a lot about development since the fall of communism. I was wondering if you could tell us, just like give us the, the really short version of what happened to this area uh, in the time between when it passed out of the hands of the Liechtenstein family uh, to when it sort of came into the hands of preservationists and, and other interested parties in the post-communist period. Thank you. Uh, it was very simple because uh, in this country there was very, a very important gentleman, Mr. Zdenek Wirt, who was uh, head of department in the Ministry of Culture. And after 1945, when the property of Liechtenstein was confiscated, he uh, offered to adopt a new law about so-called National Culture Commission. And this natural, natural, National Cultural Commission uh, took uh, over the property of cultural value from all confiscated properties from all the country. And so in this way was established the serial of so-called state castles and chateaus. So in, already in 1945 was uh, the uh, Chateau Legnice, uh, was uh, operated by the heritage uh, institution. The Valkice Chateau had uh, more sad uh, history because it was used like a prison for ladies uh, after World War II. And first in the 70s, it was open to the public. And uh, Legnice was a traditional Valkice too. But Legnice was very famous since the 17th century and already in 19th century when the tourist industry was uh, developed in this country. It was really visited by um, plenty of people. Of course, uh, between World War II uh, and World War I, uh, the, it was uh, uh, visited for free. Uh, in Valkice, you should pay to some servant uh, for the journey through the Valkice Chateau, but Legnice was used in fact like a museum during the life of Prince Johann, John II of Liechtenstein. But you know, in the communist regime, uh, there was everything was uh, protected, but nothing was cared. So uh, there were some unique projects, like for instance, Vranov Chateau in near Znoimo. Uh, we were there with Stefan some years ago, but uh, many places they really were neglected. And uh, uh, Legnice Park uh, was uh, lucky to be in the residence of uh, my faculty, landscape architecture. So the school took care for the park, and um, I suppose that it's nice that it was uh, it was uh, kept, and uh, now you can admire it. That's great. Well, thank you so much for that to help us sort of connect the dots a bit. I've got a couple more questions uh, in the chat and on Q and A, but um, I've got a request from my former boss, uh, Wendy Lures, who would like to enter the conversation. And I know Wendy did a lot to uh, support the Greenways. Sorry, and ahoy, Sudenek, ahoy, Stefan. Um, <laughs> there, there are a number of things that I think need to be added to this wonderful <laughs> tribute to Lou and Tari and everybody else. Uh, my involvement originally came through Daniel and Victoria Spichka, because Victoria is a cousin of Therese. And so we connected in New York and in Prague and every place else. Um, because Václav Havel was such a good friend of my husband, Bill Lewis and, 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 and I, um, when we wanted to connect the Greenways in Hudson and the Greenway idea, uh, it was a very easy thing to call up Václav and say, let's sign a joint agreement. And Mario Cuomo, was absolutely delighted to do this. Now, obviously, President Havel was not in person, 
but it was nothing was easy in those days because nothing was easy. But it was it was uh, a, an opportunity because from our point of view, the Rockefeller brothers' point of view, uh, it, there was a real reason to do that, and that was civil society. At that point, no mayor in any little town had any idea what representing its constituents were, how they could collaborate with the next person, what was it that was going to happen. Secondly, we, working with designers and, and, and hotel developers and everything else, we made the presentations that they could do bed and breakfasts and small hotels of six to eight rooms. They would get a return on their money in a couple of years, as opposed to many, many years if you're the Four Seasons. Daniel, uh, as a preservation architect and a person who loved music, also as, and I know this is a different subject, but the fact that he has restored this incredible theater there. Um, and we all thought it was a dream. Back in 1990, 91, step on your, you remember, Danik, how was it? how is this ever going to happen? Mm. And charrettes and World Monuments Fund and trying to raise money. And Lou and Tree hung in there and continued with all of you. And it was, it's, it's an enormous tribute. And the dream of a, of a Iron Curtain Greenway was another dream. And now it's happened. So this should give all of the people who are struggling in the vineyards trying to come up with you know enough funding to be able to support their dreams these dreams actually happened so congratulations to all of you Bahok Johnny thank you Wendy and really appreciated all your support I'll share quickly with you when I did the Svatyan Nepomuts trail in Telch which was funded by USAID we went to anybody and everybody would give us money uh, I gave a presentation in the town hall and it fell on deaf ears. And afterwards, Mayor Yelichka, who's I think possibly still a senator, but had been a senator, uh, he said, Stefan, don't worry. What you don't understand is for 50 years, if Jan said that the sky was blue on Wednesday and the government said the sky was red on Thursday, Jan would be carted off. <laughs> We don't share, it's hard for us to share the opinions. And, but there was one man who stood up at the presentation because it was a simple presentation. The, the Telch had spent a lot of money restoring the fish ponds, which were poisoned by the chemicals that were used. Telch had only recently been Sovietized. They blew through all the hedgerows and made big fields and that was poisoning the fish ponds. So the trail that I designed was to bring back the hedgerows. And a, a, a first Republican stood up at the meeting, the only one to speak and said, thank you. You are giving us back the land of our fathers. So right. that's, that's a civil society. <laughs> well, I congratulate you all. It is, it, it is for somebody who is not Czech or Slovak or has any Slavic blood in my body, um, I have to tell you that it's so gratifying for, for, for to see this kind of triumph of everything else. And love to all the Khabar children. Um, you know, uh, I loved your parents. And, uh, and, and I was just there a couple of years ago when Bill spoke to 130,000 people in, in Wenceslas Square for the 30th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. And we shared the evening before with Daniel and Victoria. And, you know, it is extremely gratifying um, and a great tribute to architectural historians, to architects, to preservationists, to all of you who invested what you have invested into this project. So congratulations. Uh, I wanted to pass along uh, from the chat, uh, congratulations also sent to, to Zdenek. Um, from Bonnie Burnham, uh, President Emerita of the World Monument Fund, uh, who says it's wonderful to hear about the history of the gardens and to see them so well uh, taken care of. 
Uh, wonderful to hear the story of the Prague to Vienna Greenway that Stefan introduced to us years ago, honored to have been one of his professors at the University of Oregon. And that is from uh, Margo Helpen. Here's a question for Zdenek. Um, can you explain if there was any connection between the Liechtenstein princes and the Habsburgs? How did they coexist? <clears throat> yeah, uh, maybe you know the name, the Maximilian the First, the emperor the last night, and uh, he had illegitimate daughter, uh, Barbara, and uh, he married her to Sigismund of Dietrichstein, and this was the reason why the Dietrichstein were the educators of the Habsburg family. And from this marriage was Esther of Dietrichstein born and was wife of uh, Johann VI of Liechtenstein. And for her, probably, I suppose, was that beautiful Renaissance villa built in Lednice. It was the first connection. And the second, uh, and, but there were no children from this marriage. So this uh, connection stopped. And then uh, the more, more, more important connection is uh, since 1903, when, uh, when Erzherzogin uh, Elizabeth Amalia, Grand Duke Erz, uh, Elizabeth Amalia of Habsburg married Alois of Liechtenstein. And from this marriage was uh, son born, Franz Joseph, the first of Liechtenstein, who was the head of the family when the properties were confiscated. He died in 1989 in, in November, uh, I suppose a week after the Velvet Revolution. He, all his life, he said that the communism must stop in Czechoslovakia and he survived the communism in Czechoslovakia. So uh, Hans Adam II, the contemporary Prince of Liechtenstein, is, uh, uh, sorry, his uh, father, Franz Joseph, had uh, the name after the emperor, Franz Joseph. So there are these connections. Thank you for filling that in for us, Daniel. Uh, in the family life, yeah. They are, of course, the political, but it's more complicated theme for a three hours long lecture. Well, maybe we'll invite you back, Daniel, for that one at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thanks for giving us a, a short version of the, the family relationships. A question from Meg Downey. Are there conservancies or landscape regulations, zoning regulations, for example, that help preserve these special landscapes in the Czech Republic, uh, especially in the individual towns along the Greenway? Yeah, they are. Uh, since 1958, there was a special law for protection of listed buildings, gardens, and so on. And now we have law from the year 18, 1987, so the law from the communist time, which still exists, still works. And uh, I must say the law was so progressive in 80s uh, that uh, it was already 12 time uh, controlled, approved by UNESCO in every inscription to World Heritage List, the World Heritage Center uh, approve if the law, the protection rules are uh, enough to protect such heritage. And uh, since 1987, we have a category of uh, cultural landscapes in the law, which was, I suppose, the first law uh, in uh, um, monument protection in Europe. And the Lednice Vajice cultural landscape was uh, protected as a cultural landscape since 1992. And uh, so this is the um, protection from the monuments point of view, but there are many protections from, for instance, forests and uh, arable uh, land and uh, water protection. So it's, uh, we are maybe overprotected. <laughs> Well, that's, I think that's the, the right side to, to err on from my point of view. Uh, a message here from Teresa Lvova. Thank you all for this presentation. It was wonderful to see familiar faces and hear familiar names. And it was a privilege to be part of it. And thank you for mentioning my name, Stefan. Uh, from uh, Lydia Hechter, uh, thank you for the lovely tribute to my parents. We miss them, but look forward to helping their vision live on. From uh, Lydia Chmelash Hechter. 
uh, from Przemysl, uh, Przemysl Krejci, I guess, in, in, in um, Valtice. Uh, Zdenku Stefano, very nice lecture. I learned something new again. Thank you all for supporting Lu, the Lou and Tire Garden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Virginia, for your student support. And thank you, Susanna. Thank you very much and good night. I'd like to uh, point out that I understand that our fabulous member of our Friends of Czech Greenway board, the Honorable Janone Walker is watching, and we salute you, Janone. Uh, from Nancy White, uh, uh, thank you uh, to you, Wendy Lures, for your fine work. We met once at Daha, but I did not know of your background. There's a former U of O architecture student and fan of you all, married into a Czech family, formerly of Brno and settled in Santa Barbara. We have been working on a similar project on our main city core. Your success is an inspiration. I, I would like to point out for my University of Oregon colleagues okay. that the Hudson River Valley Greenway, I had the privilege of meeting with uh, Lawrence Rockefeller in the early 1980s. Uh, he wanted to carry on the vision of his brother, Governor Nelson Rockefeller for cleaning the Hudson River. I mentioned to Lawrence the Willamette River Greenway, which I had the privilege of working on as a student at the University of Oregon. So in essence, the genesis of the Hudson River Valley Greenway came from the Willamette River Valley Greenway, which then was translated to the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia for the Prague Vienna Greenway. So it's got long legs in the Greenway legacy, and uh, it's in a very important movement throughout the world. But I give credit to Oregon for the inspiration of both of these greenways. Uh, Jeremy Russell has a question for Stefan. What is <clears throat> the name of the undiscovered Austrian wine that is the best in the world? <laughs> oh, the, Zdenek, there are several. Should we tell them? Because we want to keep it for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you've got to give us at least one tip. Uh, well, uh, my favorite is not a favorite of many people, but it's the Modre Portugal which is a blue Portuguese grape, and uh, it's unique to the region. Uh, there are many others. Um, what would you think, Stenek? What's your favorite? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I love uh, blue Portuguese and Rhine Riesling. This is my combination. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, the, the blue Portugal is one of my favorite Moravian reds, for sure. Yeah. Ah, a question regarding the Bauer brothers. They were astonishing artists uh, and someone wondering whether these volumes have been made public. This is from Karen Votava. Can you comment on that, Stefan? Well, I, I know that uh, there are books available, but they're no longer in print. Mm -hmm. I know that Lubomir Kamelash's family has one of them, um, <laughs> <laughs> which was his pride and joy. Um, I don't believe they've been republished. Can uh, I join? Yes, please, Susan <laughs> Halsey. The... Hi, everybody. Uh, I know a little bit about that question uh, because um, what is really disturbing is that this Codex Liechtenstein actually sits in the vault at the uh, Chateau Vaduz or Castle Vaduz in Liechtenstein, and so nobody can see it. So all these 3,000 beautiful, fantastic uh, uh, watercolor drawings are hidden. And so uh, it, there was a one-time uh, exhibit, exhibition of this Codex Liechtenstein, but that's it. And, but you can see the drawings in, in uh, Natural Museum in London and also in the Liechtenstein um, Museum in Vienna. Another question from our audience uh, for you, Zdenek. Have any American students um, uh, visited these gardens and worked with you on these projects? I can remember the group uh, of, uh, from Patni Students Travel Agency, and uh, uh, they visited the gardens twice, as I can remember. But uh, the first visit was a little bit disaster because uh, uh, they wanted to collaborate, cooperate with local students. So we created the connection to secondary school in Břeclav. 
and it was a mistake because uh, after three days the Czech students ask the American students, do you know what is the wine cellar? You don't know. So the first visit was really, very, very uh, maybe good for winemakers in our region, but not for the garden. The next year we uh, asked uh, the people, the students from Telč. And uh, because the students from Telč, they don't know where the wine cellars in Lenice Valtica are. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so the first week they worked very effectively. After first week, the Telch students they asked, "Where are these wine cellars, please?" So the second week was a little bit worse, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> but it was very nice uh, because uh, before they a little bit uh, destroyed themselves by wine. Uh, they were very useful, very, very um, enthusiastic for, for the garden, for the work. So it was like a big surprise for me, I must say. This was a nice experience. Thank you. I suppose that uh, I don't know who was uh, initiator of this. Lou Melash or Stefan, I don't know. Yeah, yeah Lou, <laughs> Lou hooked up the Putney students, but we did have the University of Pennsylvania and Cornell University students come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, in fact, I was standing by the great white pine tree by the minaret, and uh, the students were facing us, and your hand hit my chest, and you said I was the greatest pinus of North America. <laughs> Only you used the Czech pronunciation. <laughs> Well, or the Which Latin is an one. anatomical explanation, and the, I remember I had to thank you. The coeds really enjoyed that. <laughs> I'm sure, Stefan, this just enhanced your reputation. Among oh, the absolutely, the greatest penis of North America. <laughs> right here, <laughs> you don't often get an invitation, an introduction like that, do you? That's right. But we did have students from both Cornell and University of Pennsylvania who actively worked in the gardens during the charrettes. That we had. That's true. Uh, Dagmar in Toronto says this was positively fascinating. Much new information. I will definitely visit Valtica next time I'm in the Czech Republic. Thank you to the presenters and thank you for help making it available to Canadians. Charles uh, says that in Mikulčice, Mr. Dvořáček produces an excellent kosher wine. I still have a few bottles of his Chardonnay I bought last year. <laughs> uh, when I visited Valtica in the area for the last time. And can you say more about the charrette? What is that about? Well, we worked collaboratively with Zdenik. Uh, they were the World Monuments Fund sponsored design charrettes to look at both Valtica mm -hmm. and Lednica, two separate charrettes, to come up with a program to help sustain them into the future. And uh, they were very trend-setting. They were equally valuable to anybody who owned historic museums or facilities. Uh, great Czech-American, uh, Jan Hurd Pokorny, was uh, part of those charrettes. Uh, he was a native of Brno, I think, right, Stenek? Yeah. yeah. And uh, he had grown up in, or was an expatriate and returned to his country to provide great service. He provided restoration of uh, buildings in Prague and, and uh, an amazing Czech American, Czechoslovak American. But um, any more about the Shreds? How did they help uh, you guys, Denek? Because it was really for your organization that we sponsored them. Yeah, it was for me, it was quite new experience because I was a month uh, a director of the uh, heritage institution in Moravia, South Moravia, and uh, suddenly I met such uh, beautiful, nice people from all the world, experts, and uh, so many inspirations. And I can remember really Jan Herr Pokorny and Hans Dorn, who unfortunately died already, oh. and so uh, we, Stefan, me, and Hans Dorn were a trio. Uh, concerning on landscape and gardens. And uh, it was really very effective work, very effective model of conferences. 
And in my next career, I many times repeated this model because it's really very effective how to, how to get results from a conference. Thank you very much indeed once more about Monuments Fund. There's a question, how did Lenica Valtica become a uh -huh. UNESCO site? And I think that was a result of the charrettes, Denek, was that right? Or you had already put that in motion? No, it's a longer story. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, you know uh, as I studied in Lenica and I saw this uh, beautiful park every day and beautiful buildings, forests every day, uh, I was so naive that I suppose that it's normal, it's everywhere such as we have it. And uh, thanks to my friends from Great uh, United Kingdom who visited me in 1988 and they were in shock. They were fascinated. How is it possible they didn't know about this? Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, then in 1991, the Czechoslovakia uh, adopted the uh, convention about protection of world heritage culture um, natural culture heritage and uh, in that time the government adopted the list of uh, properties uh, which should be then sent uh, for nominations and then already was the Lednice Valtice culture landscape but uh, so we, we tried to do something first we had to uh, protect it uh, according our laws and then it was 1992 and then Charette came, 1993, the first one. And uh, uh, we were persuaded by the people from the world that it's really unique quality and it can be successful. And I must remember Dr. Lester Borley too, who was oh, very yes. useful, uh, very useful to advise me how to uh, work with ICOMOS and World Heritage. And I must say, all his advices were very useful. We used him as an English, uh, English, uh, how to say, expert, because uh, the first nomination translated into English, uh, I sent it to him and asked him, please, Lester, is it English or Changlish? And he <laughs> answered, oh, it's Changlish and horrible. So we asked him to improve our Royal English and uh, we sent the nomination with uh, pictures of Radek Neprash and uh, maps and so on. And uh, there is a very nice lady, uh, uh, head of the World Heritage Center, uh, Dr. Ressler. Ah. And, uh, uh, Dr. Ressler was in Lednice too. And then we sent the nomination to Paris. And uh, as I visited the different uh, committees of UNESCO, and she met me in the uh, headquarter of UNESCO in Paris, all the many years she said, I have your nomination in my office and I use it as an example to show the other people how to do it. So it was very nice to hear it from, from Mechthilde Ressler. Yeah, his first name is Mechthilde could be Danielle Spitzka. Oh. Yes, it was a lovely program. Thank you very, very much. And it was wonderful to see Turi and Lobby, who are missed terribly here, everywhere. Awful. And Wendy, thank you. You spoke beautifully. And without you, I don't know, anything would have got cracking. <laughs> Do you? It's wonderful you? to see Stefan after such a... Yes, you look amazing. Oh. Same. Oh. <laughs> You look great. Well, thanks to Susanna Helsey. <laughs> anyway, wonderful, lovely program. It was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, well, very, very clumsily. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Dan Daniel and Victoria were the heart and soul of our early adventures in Czechoslovakia. Well, I would just say in closing, it's so good to see my dear, dear friends, Denik, and I can't wait to toast you in the gardens, in Praha, in Brno, in Hileva, in Mikulov, in Valtica. 
<laughs> we will have a great ride. <laughs> Looking forward to meet you. And I would like to thank, uh, to thank Susanna Helsey because uh, without her, I don't know, uh, she was <laughs> the first person who uh, invited me to this beautiful evening. Thank, uh, for me, evening, for me, night, for your afternoon. Thank you, Susanna, very much. Thank you. Well, I thank you both for beautiful evening, but also uh, I think Zdenek, you have such a knowledge. Uh, I almost feel like we could really expand this into a series. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> and actually I would like to also point out one thing, which I just heard that our fantastic Przemek Krejcirig, who is the director of the Luentry Herb Garden has finished a major project at the Vrchnostenska garden in um, Pernstein, at the castle Pernstein. And that's another monumental task. And he, I mean, it's a beautiful garden that I would like to actually let everybody know about. And plus also, so uh, he restored the gardens at Cooks and Villa Tugenhout and Kromnerij. So he's really amazing, accomplished uh, landscape architect in in the service of the little Luentry garden in Valtice. So please yeah. come to the Czech Republic to visit all the gardens. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna. Thank you again uh, to both of our speakers for uh, you know, really compelling presentations. And, and in a fairly uh, compact uh, period of time, we got a lot of information and a lot of great images uh, to help understand and appreciate that area. I know it's certainly uh, whetted my appetite to go back. It's been years since I've been in that part of Czech Republic. Dobro noc. Dobro noc. Dobro noc. Yeah. <laughs>